All right. So hello, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a subspecialty VMR focused on uh, pulmonary and critical care medicine. Uh, my name is Maddie, and I'll be facilitating the discussion today. Uh, so today we have three guests who are joining us to, you know, just walk us through an incredible pulmonary and critical care medicine case. Um, so our specialist discussant is Dr. Hector Cajigas, and Dr. Cajigas is an associate professor at Mayo Clinic Rochester. Um, so Dr. Cajigas, thank you so much for joining us here today. And um, before we discuss our two incredible fellows who have also joined, I just wanted to um, hear a little bit about your story and your journey to pulmonary and critical care medicine. How did you um, develop an interest in the field? Oh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure. So I, I was first in Mexico as a medical student. And then when I completed my medical school, I went to do my residency in internal medicine in Chicago, University of Illinois. And then my, my teachers of pulmonary medicine were fantastic. Very nice people, the best, the, the most approachable. That's actually led me to go through that especially because I really like all internal medicine and critical care was a passion for me. And then I continued on my fellowship at Northwestern University, and then I did find a significant passion for pulmonary hypertension. I've been doing that now for the last 15 years in different roles, but that's kind of my journey in a quick way. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, and we have uh, Dr. PJ Gary, who is a pulmonary and critical care medicine fellow also at Mayo Clinic Rochester. Uh, and PJ, thanks so much for presenting a case and would also love to hear a little bit about your journey uh, to this field. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me as well. I think that's a good question. I ask myself how I got here many times <laughs> these days, uh, but really I, my initial interest was in nephrology, interestingly enough, and I went into internal medicine and my first rotation was in the ICU. So I started to fall in love with the complex hemodynamics and the ventilator and trying to fix all of that. And then I fell in love with ultrasound, which Dr. Kahigas and Dr. Ortiz also can relate to. And it was off to the races from there. I was just looking for something that would give me a nice balance of complex pathophysiology, acutely unwell patients, and then some degree of longitudinal follow-up. And obviously the pulmonologists and the critical care doctors are the smartest and the most approachable as Dr. Kahigas mentioned. So I was drawn to the field because of that too. I love that. Great. Uh, and then the, we also have uh, Dr. Gabriel Ortiz, who's also a pulmonary and critical care medicine fellow at Mayo Clinic Rochester. And Dr. Ortiz will be helping to discuss along with Dr. Cajigas. Uh, so um, Dr. Ortiz, would you also mind, you know, uh, unmuting and sharing a little bit about what led you to pulmonary or critical care medicine? Yeah, hi, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm originally from Colombia in South America. And really, uh, one of the main things that um, <clears throat> drove my decision to come to the U.S. was the possibility of doing a combined pulmonary and critical care fellowship, um, which is not, not something that is established in my country. So really, a combination of um, clinical pulmonary medicine, um, pulmonary procedures, pulmonary clinic, um, and the acute critical care setting was what, what was what really I thought was a perfect combination. Uh, so yep, made, made a lot of sense for me. Yeah, great. Well, um, enormous thank you to all three of you for being here. And um, we'll dive into the case shortly, but I just wanted to you know briefly introduce Maria and Yasmin, who are two um, CVS team members who will be helping with scribing and teaching points. So thank you both so much. Uh, so Yasmin, if you're scribing, you can go ahead and share your screen now. And uh, PJ, feel free to um, share the first aliquot. Okay, thank you so much, Maddie. So we have the case of a 60 year old patient who is presenting with progressive shortness of breath over two years. And it's progressed to dyspnea on exertion with minimal exertion and a profound limitation in her activities of daily living. In terms of further HPI, she describes a recent hospitalization 
around two months ago, where she was diaryced aggressively with 20 pounds of volume removal and an initial improvement in her symptoms. But they seem to have recurred and progressed, as I mentioned. She denies any recent weight gain, and she's been taking her medications without any missed doses. And I think it would be pertinent here to give a quick past medical history as well, because I'm sure the, the audience is going to have a few questions about this uh, aggressive diuresis and what was done in light of that. And so she has a known history of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, a documented history of pulmonary hypertension on Tadalafil, obstructive sleep apnea, not utilizing PAP therapy, coronary artery disease, status post prior percutaneous coronary intervention a number of years ago, and well-controlled hypothyroidism as well as hyperlipidemia. After the recent hospitalization, she now has a documented history of hypoxemic respiratory failure, and she's on oxygen supplementation. From a surgical perspective, a cholecystectomy. She's currently retired. She's a never smoker. And does not attest to any concerning occupational or recreational exposures, inhalational or otherwise. So we'll take a pause there. I think that's probably a, a good degree of information and plenty of things to talk about here. So Dr. Ortiz, what, what are your thoughts here about this patient presenting with dyspnea? Yes, thank you, Dr. Gary. So um, yeah, so, so several things, of course. Uh, I guess that the main uh, initial difference should be the distinction between cardiogenic and pulmonary mechanisms of dyspnea, <clears throat> and sometimes the coexistence of uh, both of those. Um, so we will we'll see during the development of the case that uh, the response to volume removal not only attests to exclusively left-sided heart failure and uh, heart failure um, type of symptoms. So that, that is one of the things. However, the fact that a patient um, response to volume removal does um, point in the direction of, of, of some type of hydrostatic phenomena, uh, number one. And then uh, number two, um, the, of course, the past medical history of pulmonary hypertension only on, on one pulmonary vasodilator, and Dr. Cajigas can also uh, guide, us, guide us there, but always when and there's patients on specific uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension therapies um, that also kind of has to raise the alarm of the compensated right-sided heart failure or, or uh, acute and chronic core pulmonality as, as potential differential diagnosis. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ortiz. I, I just had one question. Um, so you talked about, you know, immediately thinking of dyspnea as, you know, prioritizing cardiogenic versus pulmonary versus kind of coexistence of both um, etiologies. I'm curious if you could touch on the time course here. So the fact that this, um, actually I'm not, I'm not sure if this is um, what the, the sex here is, but that this has been progressive shortness of breath over two years. So I'm wondering if you could touch on how you think about the time course and how that influences your differential. Yes, yeah, certainly. So the the and and that also kind of relates to the setting that the patient is presenting to. Uh, acute versus chronic or acute and chronic dyspnea can be one of the main one of the main things to think about. Um, certainly, infectious and inflammatory processes are tend to present more in the acute fashion. Um, in more decompensated fashion, as opposed to chronic problems that can have acute decompensations 
uh, can also have a different presentation of the patient that has uh, long-standing dyspnea and has a now an acute crisis, which it seems to be the 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 time course of our of our patient. So any chronic cardiovascular or cardiac illness can have acute exacerbations, um, as well as chronic pulmonary diseases. Yeah, I love that. You're thinking, you know, both chronic, but also acute on chronic. Um, I think that's a great point. Dr. Kahigas, any um, other points you wanted to add in just from this first aliquot? Absolutely. I think that it's important to um, understand that when we're looking at a patient with dyspnea, we have to think about three systems, cardiovascular, pulmonary, as well as musculoskeletal. So it could be from either one. The most common cause of dyspnea, chronic dyspnea in the United States right now is actually deconditioning, particularly after COVID. So it's a neuromuscular state rather than a cardiovascular or pulmonary condition. So we always have to think about it. However, you are not gonna find a deconditioned patient who is able to fill up 20 pounds of extra fluid and to still believe is deconditioning. So we always have to have the background on these cases. We have a patient who has significant cardiac history and pulmonary history in the background. So that should be important for us to try to delineate what route in the World Cup of Disney to take. It's a very confusing first symptom in any primary care uh, clinic and actually leads to many, many diagnostic tests. When you have somebody who has shown to you at this level with 20 pounds of ability to diarrhea, you have to believe that what you're gonna find is not gonna be something hidden. It's gonna be something more obvious. All right, fantastic. Um, I think, uh, PJ, we can move on to the next aliquot. Absolutely. I, uh, I like how both of you alluded to the fact that this patient has at this point dulled Occam's razor, right? This patient doesn't necessarily fit into that category of one versus the other, at least not the left heart disease bucket, because the diuresis has been flowing and the, the fluid has been flowing out, yet she still has ongoing symptoms. So we have to rethink about what may be going on here. With that, I'm going to bring to you a review of systems. So the patient notes that she's been having nausea, leg swelling, this strange notion of blue fingertips, which was previously attributed to cyanosis, generalized fatigue, arthralgias, particularly with swelling about the distal MCP joints. And she notes being unable to close her fist completely for around 10 years. On further discussion, she also notes pre-syncope and actually episodes of syncope when bending over and raising her torso too quickly. As mentioned, her weight has been stable. She otherwise denies orthopnea or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and denies any significant GI symptoms or rashes. On examination, she's ephebrile, heart rate in the 80s, blood pressure 130 over 80, respiratory rate in the mid-teens, and pulse oximetry is 88%. I guess we can fill out her meds now as well. Uh, in addition to the Tadalafil, she's also on furosemide. And then we'll go A through whatever else remains, albuterol, aspirin, atorvastatin, citalopram, clopidogrel, phenofibrate, and levothyroxine. And I see a comment in the chat, is it Raynaud's? Yes. I, I suspect so, but I was, I was hoping for the discussants to dig into that or, or someone else to dig into it, and I appreciate you digging into that yourself. All right, so Dr. Ortiz, we'll head back to you, and with this um, additional interesting information in the review of systems, what, uh, how is this impacting your, your differential and how you're thinking of the patient? Yes, um, so certainly there's at least two or three systems that come up with the review of systems. Um, the first one is uh, either the pulmonary and the pulmonary vascular system, um, along with the, with the cardiovascular system, uh, with 
these symptoms of uh, of uh, dyspnea, bendopnea, um, Raynaud's syndrome. Um, all of those can point towards uh, very discrete discrete etiologies. However, uh, I, I guess for the for the initial approach would be again as Dr. Cahigas was saying, um, there's some features that could point in the direction of uh, of um, hydrostatic mechanisms for dyspnea or, or uh, hydrostatic mechanisms for pulmonary congestion, which would be uh, the vendopnea and the characteristics of dyspnea, that from, from the cardiac and cardiopulmonary standpoint. And then the additional pointers, which in the chat they are already, they are already mentioning is the presence of Raynaud's phenomenon in a patient that has already um, an established diagnosis, at least of a precapillary mechanism of pulmonary hypertension, taking a pulmonary vasodilator points in the direction of a, um, of a, a um, sorry, of a uh, rheumatological system. In terms of what would be the alarm signs to look for in this patient, so I guess the, the peril here the, the pearl would be uh, what kind of clinical symptoms are worrisome. Uh, so uh, if, we, if we go back to how to establish or how to grade dyspnea, um, we can use the, the modified medical research council scale. Um, but going forward in a patient with pulmonary hypertension, we use the WHO uh, functional class um, classification and certainly syncope or precisely ex exertional syncope would classify a patient in a functional class four from the get-go, which would make the patient a higher risk. So certainly syncope is an alarm sign and the other features could be uh, alarm, alarm signs for uh, ongoing right heart failure. And uh, as Dr. Kaigas is, is asking, what does, what does syncope means in this context? So in this context means that uh, probably the, the pulmonary pressures are rising even further during exercise, causing acute worsening of the right ventricular function and a lack of left ventricular preload that causes exertional syncope. Meaning that as the pulmonary pressures rise, um, during exercise, the right ventricle is not able to produce enough flow to fill the left ventricle. And, and, and that's the cause for exertional syncope in pulmonary hypertension. All right, really fantastic discussion. Um, Dr. Kihigas, did you have you know, anything else to add about what, which of the review systems elements you thought were most worrisome? Yeah, I'm having quite significant fun putting things in the chat here. So uh, it is uh, very, very uh, interesting that you have to detect when you obtain a good review of systems, which ones of those are going to worry you. Because you're going to always have a very long list of review of systems in a great number of patients. But when somebody tells you syncope, you have to really, really immediately pay attention to that. You have to understand how the syncope is. Is this a syncope with a prodrome, is this when exertion, is this a syncope that is gonna take you out completely like a blackout? Because there are certain diseases that are characterized by that. The hemodynamic syncope, the typical hemodynamic syncope is the one that comes with a prodrome that you are doing an exertion, you are walking, you are moving around. So you are asking a cardiac output that cannot be delivered. And that automatic, uh, selection of cardiac output to organ systems that are vital starts to be this, in disequilibrium. So you start decreasing cardiac output to your brain, your oxygen delivery goes down because you are asking to utilize it for muscle movement. And that actually sacrifices that cardiac output that is limited to your brain. If you have a syncope, there is a blackout that you don't have any advice, that's a usual fatal arrhythmia. That's that, that you don't really feel anything before that and you go out. Or if obviously, if you are witness and you have movement, then it's an epi epilepsy or something of that nature. But that's a very worrisome because it does signify grave disease. And also, also to point out that the presence of near syncope or pre-syncope is also included in the 
World Health Organization functional classification for pulmonary hypertension. So your patients start having um, pre-syncopal episodes or near syncope also places your patient around functional class three, which is also a high risk patient. Thank you both. And one of the questions that's coming through the chat is, um, you know, going to this point of syncope, but uh, the review system said syncope when bending over. I'm wondering if you could talk about, you know, the fact that it's occurring when bending over. What is that? How are you thinking through that that detail? So bendomnia and the, and the symptom of bendomnia was uh, thought to be classically secondary to um, left-sided heart failure exclusively. However, um, I recall reading a couple of studies that demonstrated that even certain patients with primary pulmonary vascular diseases and other etiologies for right-sided failure can have also bendomnia. The classic teaching is that bendomnia produces compression of the abdominal organs and increases the inferior vena cava pressures and the right atrial pressures, increases venous return, and the patient is more prone to vascular congestion if you have left-sided diastolic failure or if you have right-sided systolic failure. So it was thought to be a classic heart failure, right, uh, um, heart failures uh, symptom, but it's not so specific, um, but it's, it's kind of a classic in the textbooks. It, it is a valsalva maneuver in a way, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you also mm -hmm. do increase pulmonary vascular resistance by doing that too. So that could definitely, it's not, again, it's not specific to a particular disease, but it, it can increment your pulmonary vascular resistance. If you're listening to the heart of a patient and you want to know if that patient is having an increment in pulmonary pressure, you can actually listen to the tricuspid regurgitation murmur that they may have. So you make them make a fist or you want them to bend down and you're going to hear incremented that So. Mm -hmm. All right, and then the last question I had for you all is, um, we got the vitals and see that the patient is setting 88% on room air, and how does the, you know, the presence of hypoxemia affect how you're thinking through this case right now? Yeah, so the, the um, in general, the, the general approach to mechanisms of uh, hypoxemia, um, we, we can we can kind of go go over them with the physical exams that we have that we have. Uh, so initially, hypoxemia can be because of low inspired oxygen pressure, which in her case is it's not because we assume that she's in under stable atmospheric conditions. And then we have um, patients that would have any type of um, pure shunting. Uh, it's difficult to establish, but in a patient with clear lungs could be a possibility. Any type of intrapulmonary or intracardiac shunt, we would have other findings in the, in the exam. Um, and then the classic VQ mismatch that you could have with pulmonary vascular disease is what would you would see in a patient with hypoxemia and clear lungs. Because all the other causes, uh, parenchymal and uh, alveolar membrane disorders usually have abnormal respiratory findings. Um, so having hypoxemia with clear lungs really speaks to um, um, a disease of maldistribution of perfusion and ventilation. That, that's, that's in general the clinical approach. Of course, if you go to a textbook, they will go through whether the, um, the oxygenation problem corrects with oxygen or not, but we are just talking about our initial approach to the patient. So hypoxemia with clear lungs, it could be maldistribution of ventilation or uh, perfusion. So it speaks more to a flow vascular phenomenon than a pulmonary parenchymal process. All right, fantastic teaching on, on hypoxemia. Um, PJ, I think we can jump to the next LQAT. Absolutely, excellent takeaways. In a patient Dr. Kahigas, with... Dr. Kahigas makes, a, makes another point there and uh, he talks mm -hmm. about whether this pulse oximetry could uh, represent a, a poor measurement or a measurement error. Um, it could particularly in patients that have critical uh, digital ischemia with advanced rate knot phenomenon. So that could be also as we know, pulse oximetry utilizes um, different wavelengths of, of, of platysmography to detect oxygenated, oxygenated hemoglobin in patients. 
with different skin colors, with any type of additional coloring substance in the nails or patients with vascular insufficiency can have poor platysmographic waveforms. So the pulsatility of the blood is detected differently in the pulse oximetry platysmography algorithm uses that difference in pulsatility to detect oxygenated hemoglobin. So Raynaud's phenomenon advanced digital ischemia can also cause abnormal oximetries. That's so fascinating. I didn't really think about how Raynaud's could would affect um, the hypoxemia measurement. So, so thank you for that teaching. Uh, Dr. Kikikas, I just wanted to come to you for, oh, you had another question. Who can guess a mechanism of shunt in patients with increased pulmonary pressions? increased pulmonary pressures. Dr. Dr. Ortiz, did you want to take that? Yes. So I think what Dr. Cajigas is alluding to is the possibility of patients with a patent foramen ovale, which is 19% of the population, when they have significantly elevated pulmonary pressures, uh, they can open the, the a PFO and have a right to left flow Initially, when they have Valsalva and when they have increased intrathoracic pressures, but as the situation gets worse, they can have a more permanent opening of the uh, patent firm in Ovali. Is that, is that what, you were, what you were alluding to, Dr. Caigas? Absolutely, yes. I just want to make sure that everything is considered when you're looking at a patient that is hypoxemic in the potential presence of pulmonary hypertension. Again, this is going into more detail, but I just find this fascinating. Definitely fascinating. Thank you both. All right, so we can jump to the next aliquot now. Absolutely. I'm going to add one last pearl because we're just dropping pearls all day. But for our listeners, don't forget that it's been shown now that African-American patients have been found to have a certain degree of occult hypoxemia when using our modern pulse oximeters. And this is, again, related to what Dr. Ortiz was alluding to with the wavelength of the Plethysmography. So keep this in mind and have the writing, the index of suspicion for those patient populations as well. All right. Well, I think we've we've talked a lot about the potential for clear lungs, but let's go into the physical exam and try to round this out before we engage in further discussion here. So in general, on examination, the patient was dyspneic simply from walking between the couch to the examination table. She had jugular venous distension above the clavicle when sitting upright at 90 degrees, and there was notable hepatojugular reflux. At rest, there was no increased work of breathing and clear lungs. Heart was regular, normal rate, normal S1 and S2, but a loud P2 was appreciated, and there was a three out of six systolic murmur. The abdomen was benign with normal bowel sounds. The extremities showed trace edema. And on further skin examination, there were telangiectasias noted about the lips and the anterior chest. The fingers on both hands were thick with thickened skin. And there was the inability to clench a fist bilaterally. There were also deformities from osteoarthritis present. And neurologically, it was non-focal. I guess we can move into the labs quickly for expeditious sake. The hemoglobin was 14 and stable at baseline. The white count was seven. Platelets were 200. Sodium, potassium, chloride were normal. Sodium was 140. And creatinine was 1.03. Hepatic function was within normal limits. TSH was within normal limits. And an NT pro BMP was 9,900. We also had a ANA that was positive with a titer of one to 640 and an anti-centromere antibody that was positive. The, the NT pro BNP 
was 9,900. All right, so this is a lot of great data. Uh, Dr. Ortiz, how are you, how has your thinking of the case changed with this additional information? Yes, so I think Dr. Gary has given us uh, a lot of valuable, valuable information first uh, in, in, two, in two realms, the realm of our ideologic diagnosis and the realm of what are the consequences for that diagnosis. So um, certainly uh, in, in terms of etiologies, we have a patient certainly that has um, telangiectasia, uh, stigmata of, of um, sclerodactyly, um, just as a, as a clinical pointer there. And when we're worried about whether a patient has or not systemic sclerosis or scleroderma, um, there's a validated tool that we can use. It's called a Rodnan score. And it's a scoring system of 18 points to determine whether the patient has systemic sclerosis, uh, significant pathologic sclerosis or not. So that's a, 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 a tool that we can use to see if this is pathologic sclerosis. Of course, if there's a established sclerodactyly, it's very, it's very clear that we're potentially facing um, a, a disease of the scleroderma spectrum. And then we have a, a positive centromere antibody, which of course, the classic teaching is associated with Crest um, uh, syndrome, but more importantly, and for our case, it's actually one of the highest uh, or the, the risk factor um, for having pulmonary vascular disease associated with uh, systemic sclerosis spectrum disorders. So that in terms of our, uh, our, our etiology, also uh, ANA positive, possibly this ANA could be speckled pattern associated with the anti-centromere antibody, number one. And then number two, uh, the fact that we have elevated natriuretic peptides with that physical exam that has a, um, a high intensity P2 with a potential um, ejection, ejection uh, murmur associated with high pulmonary flow that speaks of potentially having a patient with pulmonary vascular disease and pulmonary hypertension, right-sided failure in conjunction with this diagnosis. All right, really fantastic teaching, Dr. Ortiz. Um, Dr. Kahiga put a, another fantastic question in the chat. Um, he said, excellent association of anti-centromere question. What is the usual association of SCL70 antibody presence in regards to pulmonary hypertension. Dr. Ortiz, do you, do you know about that? So, so here probably what Dr. Cajigas is pointing at is the kind of the profiling of risk of pulmonary disease in systemic sclerosis. So in general, systemic sclerosis uh, can be of the limited spectrum having any type of antibody profile. However, the presence of centromere is more compatible with the more limited forms. And what we need to have in mind is that limited scleroderma or limited systemic sclerosis is less associated with pulmonary parenchymal disease, meaning interstitial lung disease associated with scleroderma, but much higher risk for pulmonary vascular disease. So in general, patients with limited scleroderma and classically crest and positive anti-centromere have less interstitial lung disease, but more vascular disease. On the other hand, patients with anti-topoisomerase anti uh, antibodies, such as the SCL70, which is anti-topoisomerase 3 antibody, are higher risk for developing interstitial lung disease. And they can also develop pulmonary hypertension, but with less frequency than patients with pure anti-centromere. And we'll see down the road that having a positive anti-centromere is actually a criteria for screening yearly these patients for pulmonary vascular disease. That I, I'm not sure if that's what Dr. Cahigas wanted, wanted to discuss with that question. It makes me so proud to hear you. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a very good feeling. I didn't think I would feel this way, but yes, I am. Um, and I can tell you that's a, a master description of what I actually had in mind. And also a kudos to Roberto Gonzalez, who answered well too in the chat. And that actually is not an easy answer. SCL70, as you mentioned, is more... Um, compatible with the presence of fibrotic lung disease. And it has been considered in a retrospective study from Virginia State University of Virginia did show that actually had 
a protective effect for the development of pulmonary hypertension in those patients without pulmonary fibrosis. So it is considered to be actually a positive antibody to have if you don't have fibrosis, you probably will not have pulmonary vascular disease. Wow, so fascinating. Um, I'm curious, Dr. Ortiz, how would you, what would you do next in, in the care of this patient or in the workup? So uh, certainly uh, here, what, what uh, the main, and I think this is the, 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 the cornerstone of the discussion of this case is uh, early detection and which patients are higher risk. So recognizing that our patient has a higher risk profile for pulmonary vascular disease and that has a condition directly associated with pulmonary vascular disease, we need to uh, undertake the exploration of potential pulmonary hypertension. So what we wanted to kind of allude to at this point is which patients in our clinic or in our, in our patient population are at higher risk for developing pulmonary hypertension and that might need more, more screening. So this is classically one patient with systemic sclerosis. Number two, patients with family history of pulmonary hypertension, because there are genetic groups specifically uh, known to develop pulmonary hypertension easily. And in modern registries, that could be up to 18 to 20% of patients with, with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Patients that have history of pulmonary embolisms or DVT, patients with liver disease, congenital heart disease, patients with high-risk medications such as stimulants, supplements, amphetamines, patients with, that are living with HIV, and, and patients with other autoimmune conditions related associated with pulmonary vascular disease. So those patients, we need to have a, a high degree of, of, um, of suspicion. So the next step, of course, is the initial screening is our physical exam, electrocardiogram, um, natural egg peptides followed by a transthoracic echocardiogram with emphasis on pulmonary on pulmonary uh, hypertension, which requires specifically the certain measurements that we're going to hear about. All right, and PJ, I was actually wondering if I could turn to you if you could talk through kind of the answer you put to Dr. Kahigas's um, question in the chat. So it may be it may not be the exact answer, but uh, there there are data to support that many of these patients, particularly with systemic sclerosis, take up to four years in order for them to finally progress to classic pH diagnosis, meaning their, their pressures are in a place where they are, they are definitively diagnosed. Four years may be a, may be a little generous. He may, be a, he may have been looking for a more conservative estimate. But the point being, these patients sneak beneath the radar. And in the AMBITION trial, which is one of the big trials in pulmonary arterial hypertension, some of these patients, many of the patients enrolled had a mean PA pressure in the high 40s at the time of diagnosis. And when we're talking about a diagnosis that requires you to have a PA pressure of above 20 now, that means that many of those patients went a long time before being diagnosed or having distinct enough symptoms. And so to really touch on Dr. Ortiz's point, we need to have the right index of suspicion and screen these patients early. And knowing those risk categories of PAH that he very nicely outlined is the key for all of us, internal medicine, pulmonary, and even critical care physicians. One, one more uh, thing, sorry, I, I think this is, this is the time to mention this. So not, necessary, not necessarily for uh, 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 everyone to know it by memory or not, but scleroderma and systemic sclerosis is probably one of the conditions in uh, uh, that we have the most data about how to screen and how to detect pulmonary hypertension. And everything stems around the pulmonary function tests and the echo results uh, supplemented by some, by some blood work. So if anybody's interested, you, uh, there's a, an already evidence proven strategy called the DETECT algorithm or the DETECT protocol, which utilizes several results from the pulmonary function tests, the basic blood work, EKG, and a, and a, and a basic transthoracic echocardiogram to tell us which patients we, we need to refer for, uh, to Dr. Cajigas, to the pulmonary hypertension expert for a right heart catheterization. So that has been proven. So that, that's a resource that you can, you can look up easily, the DETECT uh, algorithm coming from the DETECT trial. 
All right, thank you. Thank you so much for, for that fantastic teaching. Uh, PJ, I'm wondering what, um, what more information you have about how this patient did. Oh, I have plenty, but we'll try to keep it nuts and bolts. So why don't we hone in on a few particular studies here? Let's start by touching on the chest X-ray and CT imaging, because we know that there's the concern potentially for pulmonary hypertension. Let's make sure that we're not seeing any structural lung disease. And this patient had a chest X-ray, which demonstrated mostly findings consistent with pulmonary hypertension with an enlarged cardiac silhouette, enlarged pulmonary arteries, evidence of pulmonary venous hypertension on X-ray, and a calcified aorta. Subsequently, a CT scan was done, which demonstrated diffuse ground glass opacities with some interstitial thickening, but was without evidence of fibrosis or distinct interstitial lung disease. We also had a VQ scan, which showed a low suspicion for pulmonary embolism. And in light of the high index of suspicion, we'll say for the purposes of where we are in our current morning report, this patient went was whisked off to right heart catheterization, given that she was deemed likely euvolemic uh, in light of the fact that her weight had been stable. And I can give you some of those right heart cath numbers, and then we can talk about what those look like. So the mean PA pressure was 43 with a systolic PA pressure in the 70s. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure was 11. The pulmonary vascular resistance was measured at nine wood units. Cardiac output 3.5, cardiac index 2. And this patient underwent multiple other interventions during the right heart catheterization, including oxygen, which improved the saturation, but there was no change in hemodynamics. Nitric oxide, which decreased the PVR slightly to seven wood units. And there was no change seen with nitroprusside. All right, so Dr. Ortiz, we'll, we'll jump to you. And um, Dr. Kiki has mm -hmm. put another fantastic question in the chat. If so, if you could talk about which values in the right heart cath have the most important prog prognostic value. Yeah, so this, this, this question is also uh, very relevant. And uh, I guess we can start by, uh, by um, answering Dr. Uh, Kahigas's question, and then we'll go in, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch with, uh, on our main objective, which is kind of the initial approach and classification of pulmonary hypertension. So you are always tempted to say that the most important prognostic value in a patient with pulmonary hypertension is the pulmonary, are the pulmonary pressures. And that's one of the big teachings we wanted to convey is that pulmonary pressures per se uh, are not uh, a strong prognostic indicator. Why? Because when the right ventricle has already completely failed, is unable to generate flow. So terminal patients with right heart failure and the patients that Dr. Cahigas are uh, uh, sometimes is managing in, in, in his clinic with palliative care, they have tend to have low pulmonary pressures because the cardiac output is so is low. So really the important uh, prognostic values come from um, the stroke volume and stroke volume index. And this is based on two large registries, the, the United States registry and the international registry. The stroke volume, stroke volume index are uh, some of the most important prognostic values much more than the pulmonary pressures. In fact, pulmonary pressures are not a good prognostic indicators, indicator in terms of, um, of, um, of mortality. And then the other measures of consequence of, of what happens with that right ventricle. So uh, as he's uh, mentioning, um, right atrial pressure and pulmonary vascular resistance also, but the strongest are uh, cardiac index, stroke, stroke volume, and stroke volume, volume index. So measures, measures of right heart performance. Um, that's, that's kind of the answer to that question. Uh, and um, in terms of how, what, what to do with these results. So one of the teaching points importantly is that after the sixth uh, consensus in pulmonary hypertension in knees in France, um, so pulmonary hypertension is defined by the mean pulmonary artery pressure, which we usually don't get in our echo reports. 
and that's one of the big lessons that we want to convey is the definition states that you should have a mean pulmonary pressure of more than 20 millimeters of mercury. And they no longer um, use the changes with exercise. So that is the definition of pulmonary hypertension. And then we have the, um, the, the kind of the, the question of what type of pulmonary hypertension our patient has. So again, the, the, the consensus and the WHO classification divides pulmonary hypertension in five different groups. To, rem to remember uh, quickly, the first group is pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is probably what our patient has. Group two is the most common group in the world, which is pulmonary hypertension secondary to uh, left-sided heart disease, whether it is diastolic heart failure, valvular um, heart failure, or valvular issues. And then number three is, patient, is pulmonary hypertension secondary to parenchymal lung disease. Number four is obstructive lesions, including thrombotic and also compressive tumors. And then uh, the group five is the miscellaneous group. So that is kind of the big things that we're looking for in, in our right heart cath. Um, I don't know if that's what, what you were asking for, Dr. Cajigas. No, yes, you absolutely are saying it. I'm, I'm just putting some things in the chat as well because that changed just two months ago. I yes. mean, three, August 2022. That's when they changed okay. in the mean pulmonary artery pressure number of 20 and a PVR of more than two because that is actually, for some reasons, it is unclear to everyone. The numbers that we use are just too high in the past. So having a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 20 and a PVR more than two is more than two standard deviations to either side. So that would be actually very abnormal. We should not have those numbers. So pulmonary hypertension is having mean pulmonary artery pressure of 20 or more and a PVR more than two. And pulmonary arterial hypertension, you need to have a left heart pressure that is less than 15 or normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Correct. And, and just to, to clarify for the, for the uh, so the, the, the pulmonary vascular resistance is in, in, in more than two, is, it, is expressed in wood units. A normal PVR should be between 1.5 and two. And that is a way to normalize your pulmonary pressures to your filling pressures and your cardiac output or your cardiac index. Mm -hmm. You can have that expressed in dynes or in wood units. It doesn't matter if you divide by 80, you should convert, you should be able to convert dynes in, uh, to, to, um, to wood units. But our patient had a 9.1, so that is significantly severely elevated with a left atrial pressure, a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of 11, meaning that the filling pressures, the left atrial filling pressures were normal. So the problem was not on, their left, on the left side of her heart. The problem was intrinsic to the vascular um, bed of the lung. So that, that's how, how you would interpret that and classify the patient in, in group one pulmonary arterial hypertension or precapillary pulmonary hypertension. All right, fantastic. Thank you for walking us through the, even you know, these updated uh, pulmonary hypertension guidelines. Um, so thank you. And uh, Dr. Kihi, has any, any other thing, anything else to add, um, you know, before we go back to PJ? No, no, I think that we, we have discussed a lot here. So I don't want to overwhelm anyone here because this is very, very comprehensive and very good. Yeah. All right, PJ, back to you. Okay. Well, we're going to close things out and then touch on final pearls. So this patient was ultimately admitted to the hospital, as I'm sure many have picked up on. The patient's Tadalafil was continued, as well as home loop diuretic therapy. And in light of the hemodynamics noted and the now diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension with associated limited cutaneous scleroderma, the patient was initiated on IV epoprostenol, which was up titrated and then dismissed to the outpatient setting and continued on both of those drugs. 
Amazing. Well, what a uh, phenomenal case. And PJ, thank you so much for kind of walking through it in such a, a structured way with, with all these pearls. Um, Dr. Ortiz, I just wanted to you know, turn it over to you to hear any reflections you have on how it was talking through this case and kind of any last pearls you want to share. Yes, I guess the other the other uh, pearl that we had in mind when we when we put the case together was uh, how to make the distinction or how to approach the results of the echo versus the versus the calf. So it's important to know that the majority of your transthoracic echocardiograms are going to be able to report a right ventricular systolic pressure that in a patient that doesn't have pulmonic stenosis. Uh, should reflect the, pul right ventric the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. That number is an estimate uh, of the pulmonary systolic pressure, and it does not place your patient um, in a category of mild, moderate, or severe pulmonary hypertension. If you have a patient with elevated RVSPs, then you should place your patient in a risk category or an e echo risk category for pulmonary hypertension, meaning your echo results should place your patient in low intermediate or high probability. If you have high RVSP or right ventricular pulmonary pressures with signs of right ventricular dysfunction, then your patient is high probability and deep, you're, you need to send your patient to a pulmonary hypertension uh, specialist to get a right-sided heart catheterization. If you have a patient with somewhat elevated pressures. Uh, and for that, we measure something called the, the tricuspid regurgitation peak velocity, if that is between 2.9 and 3.4, meaning moderately elevated pressures. Without signs of right ventricular dysfunction, your patient is in the intermediate probability and probably what you need to do is just follow up that patient in time. If the pressures are moderately elevated, but your, your patient has signs of right ventricular dysfunction and dilatation, that is high risk and needs to go for right heart catheterization. So that's, that's essentially what we, what we wanted also to convey that having elevated pressures in your, in your echo doesn't necessarily make the diagnosis of right ventricular of pulmonary hypertension or not having elevated PA pressures necessarily rules that out. Yeah, thank you for making that distinction. And uh, Dr. Kahigas, I'll come to you. To, I know you've put a lot of really fantastic pearls in the chat. I'm wondering if you could uh, share some of those out loud. Yeah, this is this is complicated. And this is because uh, Hassan and um, Justin, they, they were asking this question about transpulmonary gradients uh, to determine mixed etiology versus lung etiology or the use of nitroperoxide as a pulmonary vasodilator. It is not. Nitroperoxide is not an accepted pulmonary vasodilator. It's usually used in the CAT lab for patients who have hypertension or increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure to try to minimize the impact on the pulmonary circulation so we can have a clearer case. But it's not a, 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 a patient that if it's lower, it would be considered a nitric oxide responder or an acute responder. We didn't go into that because that's quite specific. Now, transpulmonary gradient, which is the difference between your mean pulmonary artery pressure and your wedge pressure, it is a number that is usually used in pre-cardiac transplant because you don't have a lot of a stroke volume variation. So transpulmonary gradient uh, has a lot of a stroke volume changes because it accounts for the mean pulmonary artery pressure with systolic pressure changing that as we discussed before. So we use rather the diastolic gradient, the difference between your diastolic pulmonary artery pressure and your wedge pressure, that is what differentiates more if there is more than the expected transmitter pressure from the left side into the right side. Again, this is quite complex. So we can go one-on-one -on -one if somebody has a question on this. Yeah, thank you. And I do wanna be mindful of um, everyone's time here. So, um, just wanted to, you know, thank PJ again, and I, PJ, I just wanted to turn to you to see if you had any, you know, last reflections before we jump to the the teaching points that Maria has prepared. I don't have any last reflections. No. All right. Uh, well, thank you again for presenting the case, and Dr. Ortiz, Dr. Cajigas, just really phenomenal teaching here. Uh, so thank you for taking the time and just sharing all of these pearls. Uh, all right, with that, I will turn it to Maria, who has summarized a lot of the teaching we've learned today.
Well, this was such an awesome case. Um, I definitely have to read it again, like listen to it again and again and again, because a lot of like physiology just went right over my head. Uh, but I tried to capture at least a little bit of the essence of the teaching pearls and points that were made today. We started with um, a BMR favorite um, chief concern, which is dyspnea. Um, and it, that, I think that's like the beauty of the subspecialties VMRs that we get to really uh, hear at a point of view that we don't usually hear uh, from like Tuesday to Sunday. So it's really interesting the way that you guys put this NIA in different buckets. Um, so cardiogenic versus pulmonary versus musculoskeletal. It was very shocking to hear. I wasn't expecting the most common cause of this NIA to be the conditioning and musculoskeletal, which actually like makes sense, but I think uh, we're uh, sometimes very excited about like the weird uh, disorders that we don't really focus on what's common. This is definitely less likely with a person with extensive past medical history, uh, especially past medical history concerning the heart and uh, lungs. Um, but then we, you know, as you think of dyspnea, you get to really focus on a lot of like the signs and symptoms and how that localizes beautifully to either the lung, the right heart of the, the right side of the heart or the left side of the heart. And so for example, the response to volume removal orients us to a hydrostatic phenomenon of dyspnea, which makes us think a little bit more about the left heart uh, bendopnea, uh, which is essentially like a Valsalva maneuver, um, makes us think of Patients with elevated filling pressures, not exclusively found in left heart failure, but it definitely, you know, we, we have to also think about that. Um, hypoxemia in patients with clear lungs makes us think about, you know, a VQ mismatch, not much of like a parenchymal disorder. So all of those clues really points us beautifully into a localization of heart and lungs. Um, time course is also very important. I really like how you don't only focus on acute versus chronic, but also acute on chronic, which I think is a little bit more um, common to see. And definitely infections and inflammatory diseases tend to present with acute decompensation. So um, always take in consideration the time. Uh, I really like that we shouldn't overestimate the value of the review of systems. I think sometimes we are very prone of, you know, that that's like step one mentality. <laughs> you see something and then you you you, you may immediately think of a diagnosis. Um, but I really like to step back a little bit, don't overestimate the value of um, the review of systems, but instead focusing on the alarm signs for pulmonary hypertension when we hear um, the HPI. I think pulmonary critical care is definitely a subspecialty that focuses a lot on like treatment at the same time it focuses on diagnosis. So having that severity, um, you know, thinking about the severity and alarm system really makes us think about the correct um, steps to follow, not only in diagnosis, but also in treatment. So for example, exertional syncope really orients us to a emergency, so a functional class type four. The pathophysiology of this is the increase of pulmonary pressure worsens the right ventricular function, um, which, um, which um, you know, makes us lack a little bit of preload and makes us lose uh, the cardiac output. Um, so that's definitely a, a large sign for pulmonary hypertension. Near syncope or pre-syncope are also like a class three, so be cautioned with it. And whenever you have like a lot of sound coming and like the taste of autoimmune disorders in the case, um, I really like how we should focus on the etiology and the severity of what those signs, symptoms, and labs mean, not only on etiology. Um, so for specifically, specifically for scleroderma spectrum disorders, um, you know, for etiology, we have the antibodies. We can also use the Rodman skin score uh, to determine what type of um, scleroderma spectrum disorder we're dealing with. Um, and for the severity, you know, limited scleroderma crest and positive anti-centrum positive anti-centromere antibodies um, really orients us to high risk pulmonary vascular disease and its lower risk for parenchymal disease. And on the other hand, um, systemic scleroderma and positive anti-copoisomerase or SCL70 antibodies orients us more to low risk pulmonary vascular disease and high risk uh, parenchymal disorder. And then we, we sort of, we're, we're like making this picture of dyspnea, uh, acute on chronic, uh, 
very strong autoimmune flavor. Uh, and then we had the results of the, the echo and the catheterization. So we, we knew the patient had pulmonary hypertension and here are some pearls about it. Um, always think about the five different etiologic ideology group. So the first being pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, that was always very confusing for me as a student, <laughs> how there's other four different classes of pulmonary hypertension that are not specifically pulmonary arterial hypertension. The second class being the most common one, secondary to heart disease. The third one, parenchymal disorder, secondary to parenchymal disease. The fourth, secondary to some obstruction lesions that these can be thrombotic or compressive. Um, and the fifth one, miscellaneous. So like, that's my favorite category because everything's game. Um, there's new definitions for the pulmonary arterial hypertension, which include, you know, an elevated, um, media, me, an elevated mean pulmonary arterial pressure above 20 with a, an elevated PDR of more than two. And very importantly, they have to have a normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure um, to be considered PAH. The detect algorithm detects pH in asymptomatic stages. So I think that's very important to see. Um, we they usually don't think about uh, pH when they're asymptomatic, but it's definitely the best moment to, to do this diagnosis or at least think of this diagnosis. So I think that's a very good pearl. Um, and very surprisingly, most important prognostic value from the echo in pulmonary hypertension is not pulmonary pressures which in retrospect, this makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Although definitely I, ne I, I needed um, somebody to grab my hand and walk me through it. So the, the reason why they're not the most important pronostic values is that they require an adequate right ventricular function to be elevated. So if we are only concerned about um, those values, we might be losing like the severity. So instead focus on like the stroke volume, the stroke volume index and the cardiac index. Uh, which definitely correlate more into mortality. Um, I think this is a great case. A lot of pressures, volumes, gears, kind of <laughs> stuff. Uh, <laughs> and um, I really appreciate all of you because I think uh, my mind is just blown and everybody else is just blown. Um, so thank you. My mind is also blown. And Maria, you summarized that teaching so, so well. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, and the last big thank you to um, Dr. Ortiz, Dr. Cajigas, PJ, just thank you all so much for, for being here and sharing this wonderful case with us. Um, and we, yeah, and we will uh, see you all next time. Bye -bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you.